Thank you, Corey, again, and thank you all for sticking around. Um, so immunotherapy is a paradigm on the rise, as I believe everyone in this room would know. Cancer has long been known to be a disease in which the immune system has failed. Uh, cancer are abnormal cells. The immune system's job is to identify abnormal cells and get rid of them. So something is wrong there. Uh, immunotherapy is already an established component and has been for many years in the management of hematologic malignancies, where we use allogeneic stem cell transplant and the like, but success in solid tumors has lagged behind. It was previously thought to be rele relegated to quote-unquote immune responsive tumors. This term has always bothered me because there's a tumor and there's an immune system. The immune system should be able to attack the tumor. Um, prior efforts prior to PD-1 inhibition focused on direct stimulation of the immune system, which was associated with high toxicity, um, and the identification of what to tell the immune system to go after was complex. Um, so it didn't work, and it was really, really toxic. So the program DEATH-1 pathway uh, is one of these checkpoints that are present in the body that make the T cells say, you know, don't kill me, basically. So the human body is saying to the T cells, please don't kill me. Uh, so you've got a T cell in pink here. It's floating around. It gets activated, sees something that it wants to get. Um, and then when PDL1 on the cell surface binds to PD1 on the T cell, it becomes energic and does not kill that cell. The problem is that tumors can also develop PDL1. So this is an overly simplistic view of why PD1, PDL1 inhibitors might work, because if you inhibit this mechanism of tumor uh, immune cell evasion, the tumor may be able to be eradicated by the immune system. So there have been multiple trials that first evaluated in the second line PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors as compared to docetaxel, which was heretofore our preferred second line agent after platinum doublet failure. So here's all of them. Okay, so here is uh, uh, pembrolizumab limited in PDL1 positive disease in the upper right. We've got nivolumab in squamous and non squamous. We've got a tezolizumab bound in the bottom left. And what you see here is that the overall survival is improved uh, when you give nivolumab, a tezolizumab, or pembrolizumab as compared to docetaxel. So, you know, this led to a marketing onslaught um, and patients coming in and asking why can't they get the magical drug that they saw on TV. Um, but, and that led to some back pu pushback from the doctors, but these drugs really are a breakthrough. Uh, PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors can lead to durable responses. The toxicity is much better than we see with cytotoxic chemotherapy. So here, from the nivolumab phase one study, you can see that the five-year overall survival is 16%. That's amazing. Who would have thought five years ago we would be talking about patients with metastatic lung cancer who went on to a phase one study? So these are heavily pretreated patients who have a five-year overall survival that high. In Keynote 24, which was recently updated at World Lung, the median, um, the median survival of 30 months for these patients with PDL1 overexpression. And so these really are a breakthrough, um, but we still have a lot of work to do. The majority of patients do not benefit from PD1 or PDL1 inhibitors. Our overall response rates remain relatively low. Even if you look at PDL1 pre-selected patients, we look at Keynote 24, greater than 50% staining by the DACO 22C3 assay, response rate is less than 50%. So if we look at targeted therapy, that's our paradigmatic goal. right? If someone has an EGFR mutation and I give them osimertinib, I'm pretty pretty confident it's going to work. And that's what I'd like to be able to get to in immunotherapy. Whether we'll achieve that, I don't know, but that's the goal. Um, and the drugs currently remain limited in the metastatic setting, and it's unclear how long to keep patients on these drugs. 
So PDL1, I mentioned before, this is a biomarker. It's our, it's a sort of a love the one you're with situation with this biomarker um, because it has significant limitations. It is heterogeneous. So if we take a look, this is a picture of a biopsy, uh, a single biopsy of a tumor. And up at the top, you can see it is completely negative for PDL1. Down at the bottom of the same biopsy, we see it is floridly positive. So if we see this degree of heterogeneity in a single biopsy, imagine how much heterogeneity occurs in a human being. Um, and the other issue with this uh, biomarker is that it is dynamic. So with treatment, it will change over time. So we're taking uh, our treatment decision based upon a single needle at one site inside of a whole person um, with all of these limitations. Also, how do we define PDL1 positivity or negativity is really, really complicated and can make your head spin. So every one of the drugs that has been developed has its own assay that has been developed alongside it. So the blueprint study, which was uh, led by ISLAC um, and Dr. Hirsch, noted that at least when you're looking at PDL1 staining on the tumor itself, there's a good degree of concordance between the various PDL1 assays, which is reassuring, um, with the exception of SP142, which is the Ventana assay um, that was developed alongside atezolizumab. So I saw this data, I say, okay, they're all pretty much the same on the tumor, except for the fact that the Ventana um, SP142 has a little bit less sensitivity. I was reassured, I said, okay, this is what I'm going to go with. But then at ESMO, Dr. Gadgil presented this data, which was looking at 22C3 versus SP142 in the atezolizumab studies, and found that the sensitivity for PDL1 positivity was higher with SP142 than it was for 22C3. So I'm just left completely confused with this assay, and it's a big problem moving forward. So what about tumor mutation burden? We've heard a lot about this. Uh, mutational load is associated with a greater number of potential neoantigen. This is already known to be an important biomarker in CTLA-4 blockade, um, which was indicated by Dr. Snyder in 2014, since uh, also shown in PD-1 blockade by Dr. Rizvi in 2015, um, normally assessed using whole exome sequencing. But as um, um, Dr. Rudin presented before, um, we're seeing that there might be some concordance with NGS panels, but you have to remember that each one of those NGS panels then needs to be validated to prove that its TMB is the same as the whole exome sequencing TMB. So what if we combine TMB and PDL1? So this um, was uh, uh, present from the presentation by Dr. Peters, looking at the Checkmate 26 data. Um, and what you can see here, this is breaking down by high uh, tumor mutation burden and PDL1. And when you look at this, what you can clearly see is that patients really group into two groups. There's those patients who have high tumor mutation burden and high PDL1 staining, and they do really, really well. They're indicated in pink. But those patients who have any mix of negative and positive for the other ones, where it's not positive for both, really do about the same and nowhere near as well. And again, the goal is looking at um, erlotinib here for EGFR negative. If you don't have the marker, it doesn't work. That's what we want to be able to do for these patients. We're giving these patients drugs that um, they're on for a long time. They have limited time to get a response. We want to give them the most bang for their buck. An other issue with tumor mutation burden is that we're learning now that it also is a bit of a blunt instrument. It's not purely the number of mutations that's important. So this was done based upon uh, data from renal cell carcinoma. So renal cell carcinoma tends to respond to immunotherapy, and yet it has a low tumor mutation burden. So what's the deal with that? So they actually looked at this, and what they found was that the type of mutations that are present there, they tend to have a lot of insertion deletion mutations, which cause frame shifts in the reading, and that creates a lot of neoantigens. In contrast, a single non-synonymous mutation will lead to, let's say, one neoantigen. If you have that same as an insertion deletion with a frame shift, it creates nine times as many neoantigens. So we have to be measuring not just the absolute number of tumor mutations, but what actually is underlying them. And this really makes me think of this uh, 
fable it comes from the Indian subcontinent. So you have a bunch of blind men who are feeling an elephant. And that's what we have. We have surrogate biomarkers. So we've got one guy who's in the front. He's grabbing the tusk. He says, this is obviously a spear. And then he goes, someone is in the back. This is a rope. And, and that's what we're doing. We have surrogate biomarkers. And no one is able at this point to open their eyes and say, look, guys, I think this might be an elephant. Um, and I think that that's important as we're looking forward in terms of biomarkers here. So gene expression signatures are an important uh, progress in this space, and I think that they're an um, exciting opportunity. Um, so this is using a pretreatment biopsy, RNA extraction. You can actually see it, what genes are being expressed in the tumor, and this provides a real functional assessment of the genetic landscape. Um, gene signatures have been developed and validated in both melanoma and head and neck cancer, but it's not currently a clinically utilized Test. So this was from a presentation at ASCO this past year looking at head and neck cancer. But what I'd call your attention to, on the left we have um, data based upon mutational load. Um, the blue are indicated responders, the pink are non-responders. Um, and what you can see here is that the amount of uh, total mutation burden um, between those patients who respond and don't respond is not much different. But if you take a look on the right side, of the screen, you'll see the gene expression profile, and there you can see that those patients who have a uh, response have a much higher score on that gene expression profile. Um, and those patients who have a low score are very unlikely to respond. In fact, in that analysis, those patients who had a low score had no responses. Another question that has come up in PD1, PDL1 inhibition is how long do we need to give these agents? In the melanoma studies, we found that two years of therapy seemed to work. You know, that's what they gave for the vast majority of these trials. After the studies, people stopped, and they gave some data, you know, two years ago at ASCO. They said, oh, or this past year at ASCO, they said, look, most patients who stop at two years are able to retain their response with over a year of follow-up. That was reassuring. It made me think that after two years, we could stop. Um, and in fact, the biology of PD-1 inhibition would argue that the T cells are activated. We don't need to keep activating them with, uh, with biologic therapy. These drugs are very expensive. It would be nice if we could stop them. So this, uh, amongst other things, led to Checkmate 153. This took patients who were on nivolumab for one year and then randomized them to either continuation beyond a year or stopping and retreating as needed. So when this was presented by, Dave, by Dr. Spiegel at ESMO this year, I, I thought that this was going to be, uh, they were going to be equivalent, uh, but they were not. The hazard ratio of, was for the progression-free survival was 0 0.42, strongly favoring continuation of nivolumab. So, and there was a similar effect in terms of stopping or not stopping, seen whether they had a CR or PR or whether they had stable disease. Continuation of nivolumab in this patient population clearly improved outcomes. Um, there was no difference seen in overall survival in this study, but it's very, very early. Um, so this was, uh, this really changed the way I thought about this, such that my patients who are on PD-1, PD-L1 in inhibitors, I tend to continue it until progression or toxicity. So this makes me think, so what other populations might benefit from the perspective of, uh, of biomarkers as well as clinical outcomes? Um, so other forms of immunotherapy tend to work best in a minimal residual disease state. So the uh, sub-study of the Alchemist study, Anvil, is evaluating adjuvant nivolumab. Um, one of the other areas where we've seen enhanced immune responses is among patients who have recently received radiation. So this was from the phase one study Study, Keynote 001 of pembrolizumab, and it showed that both the overall and progression-free survival were improved for patients receiving pembrolizumab who had had prior radiotherapy. And reasons why this may be, when you cause, when you do radiation, you might be releasing this neoantigens that prime the immune system. I can wave my hands all about this, but the fact is we don't really know why they would have this response. Um, but recently uh, published in um, Dr. Langer spoke about this yesterday, the Pacific study, evaluating dervalumab or matching placebo after chemoradiotherapy in lung cancer, 
And you know, here's the progression-free survival curve, and it basically, I think it speaks for itself. We're seeing a marked improvement um, from 5.6 months median to 16.8 months. I think the magnitude of that difference is important. Um, if we were just talking about, well, we're giving the PD-1, PDL, in this case, PDL-1 inhibition early, then we would expect to not see a one-for-one -one exchange on months on immunotherapy to months of improvement in progression-free survival. Remember, in the average population, unselected for PDL1 responses to these agents is somewhere 15%, 20%. We're seeing a one-to-one -one correlation between uh, the time that we're adding of therapy and prolongation of progression-free survival. I think that's very meaningful. I'll be interested to see the overall survival data, of course, but I think this is an important study. And then we led a study uh, recently, which we presented this past year at the World uh, Lung Cancer Conference, where we looked at oligometastatic lung cancer. So similarly, many of these patients had received recent radiotherapy, or they'd received recent radiofrequency ablation. So patients who had oligometastatic disease, which we defined as those patients who had up to four sites of metastatic disease, um, completed locally ablative therapy to all visible sites of disease, and and then we gave patients pembrolizumab for six to 12 months, depending upon their tolerability. Um, and this is what we saw. In this patient population with you know, metastatic disease, we saw an 18-month progression-free survival. These are preliminary data of 64%, which is very, very exciting. Um, and so I think that the combination of immunotherapy with radiation in various modalities may be an interesting uh, avenue to pursue. So in summary, PD-1 inhibitors have substantial activity in non-small cell lung cancer, and I think it is fair to say that immunotherapy has completely changed the landscape of non-small cell lung cancer therapy. Uh, but we must remember that PD-1 inhibitors as monotherapy do not work in the majority of patients. And when they do, it's unclear still how long we need to treat them. Uh, one year we see may not be enough. Maybe two years is enough. I don't know at this time. Um, we have a lot of efforts underway to improve outcomes for patients on immunotherapy, uh, whether it be improvement of biomarkers, identification of clinical populations more or less likely to benefit, as well as combining immunotherapy with other treatments, and I believe we'll hear more about those in the subsequent talks. So I thank you very much.